All right, our Torah portion this morning is from Exodus 27, verse 20, through chapter 30, verse 10, and it is Tetzaveh, which means you shall command. And so here we find God telling Moses in verse 20, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn how long? Okay, so the lamp had to always be kept burning in the tabernacle of the congregation uh, without the veil, which is before the testimony. And it says that Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. And it's to be a statute for how long? To their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. Okay, so the menorah had to be kept burning every day. They would take care of it at evening, and then in the morning they would take care of it again after it had been burning all night to make sure that the wicks were working, that the oil was in the lamps. So every day they had to make sure the menorah stayed lit. Now that center one is known as the Western Candle, uh, and what's fascinating is they say in Jewish literature that 40 years before the temple was destroyed, okay, what year was the temple destroyed? Subtract 40, what does that bring you to? They say in 30 AD, all of a sudden, that middle candle that they used to light the other ones would never stay lit. It just stopped, and it's supposed to be every single day. I wonder what happened in 30 AD. Hmm. Okay, let's look at Exodus 28, verse 1 and 2. It says, bring Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, near to you from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me in what office? The priest's office, even Aaron. And then it names his four sons, Nadab and Abihu, who we know died at the grand opening ceremony, leaving Eliezer and Itamar, Aaron's sons. So you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and they're to be for glory and beauty, which is why the garments uh, always had to stay nice, but how would you like to have white linen garments working around sacrifices? <laughs> how many of you know is going to get messed up a little bit? Well, when they got uh, too bad, they would cut them up into strips, the linen garments, and they would put the strips in baskets in the women's court, and the women could then take the linen strips home that had been used for the sacrifices for whatever, and uh, they ended up also using them for wicks in the 75-foot-high menorahs. The young priests would go, and they would grab the linen cut-up strips, and they would become the wicks. But guess what else? When it talks about Yeshua, when he was born, was wrapped in swaddling clothes, it means strips. Yeshua's garments was the priestly garments as a baby that he was wrapped in that was used by the priest. You know, this is uh, quite amazing. Okay. Now, here's something I want to bring out too. Last Friday, not yesterday, but last Friday was the seventh of Adar, which was, what happened on the seventh of Adar? Moses was born and Moses died. Well, you know what is fascinating? This Torah portion, let me bring this up. Uh, as you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy, there's Torah portions. In Genesis, here's the name of the 12 Torah portions. We're now in Exodus. There's the name of the 11 Torah portions. We're now on Tetzaveh, which is the 20th Torah portion. Last week, Teruma was when Moses died. Well, guess what? From the time Moses is born... Throughout the entire rest of the Bible, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Moses is mentioned in every book but this one. This chapter, after he dies, he passes away, and this whole section, Torah portion, is all about Aaron. 
As a matter of fact, Moses' name is mentioned 800 times from the time he is born. But here in this one Torah portion, Tetzaveh, Aaron is mentioned 37 times, and Moses isn't mentioned at all. He's referred to, like, tell your brother Aaron. But it's amazing that the 20th Torah portion, if we remember, uh, let me show you this. Here we find Kof is the numerical value of 20. When you count uh, in Hebrew, the first 10 letters is 1 through 10, then it goes by 10. And we see that Kof is the 20th Torah portion. And Kof can be written two different ways. Well, get a load of this. In Exodus 32, 32, which is next week's Torah portion, Look at this. It says, yet now, he's trying to make atonement for the sin of the golden calf. And he says, yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and then there's a hyphen or a line in your Bible. It's the only place in the whole Bible where you find this hyphen. It means like there's a pause. Moses is thinking the sin of the golden calf is too great. There's no way you could forgive their sin unless some kind of atonement is made. And so what does he say? Blot me, I pray you, out of the book which you have written. So here, Moses asked to be blotted out of the book which he has written. Well, guess what? Where it talks about your book in that verse, you have this word. Now, you can see the word sefer, which means book. You can see the mem, which is from. And that's from your book, okay? It's me, Sifreka. Well, it's amazing. It's the 20th. It ends with cough. So Moses says, blot me out of the 20th Torah portion, and his name doesn't appear in the 20th Torah portion. Amazing. Only God could do something like that. Okay, now we're going to move to the shoulder stones, Look at Exodus 28, 9 through 12. It says, you shall take two onyx stones and you shall engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel or the sons of Jacob. And how many sons did he have? And so we see there are 12 names. Now, these were written on the shoulder stones according to when they were born. It's the birth order. Six of their names on one stone and six of the remaining names on the other stone according to what? So that's what these were based on, their birth. With the work of an engraver, like the engravings of a signet, you are to engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel, and you're to make them to be set in settings of gold. And you shall put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of a memorial to the sons of Israel. And then look at this. Look at the context. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. When we think of uh, a memorial, it's something so that you remember. Now, how many of you remember that God told Moses uh, everything in the tabernacle is to be based on the pattern in the heavenlies? That means as Aaron is the high priest on earth, Yeshua is the high priest in heaven, and Guess what else that means? Just as Aaron bears the names of the sons of Israel on his shoulders, so Yeshua in heaven also has the names of the sons of Israel on his shoulders. Okay, he doesn't have church denominations on his shoulders. He's got the names of the sons of Israel in his high priestly uh, ministry. But also, it was on his shoulders he carried the wooden beam of the cross that he died on. Okay, this is, this is really powerful. We also see over his heart with the breastplate. They are also have the names of the children of Israel, but this time, rather than in the order of their birth, it's in the order of how they journeyed when they in camp. They broke camp and they journeyed. It is based on that. But that is over the high priest's heart. So again... In the heavenly tabernacle, heavenly Jerusalem, where the Lord is ministering, he's not only bearing the names of the sons of Israel on his shoulders, they also 
cover his heart as well. But here's what's so sad. Oh, that reminds me of something else. Uh, I'll just bring up. I, I don't have the verses right offhand. But I remember a few weeks ago in the Torah portion at the very first Shavuot Pentecost when Moses goes up to the mount for the first time, okay, and they're building the golden calf, which is our Torah portion basically coming up. God tells Moses to make sure that the priests and the people do not get close to the mount or they'll die. Everyone familiar with that? Who were the priests? They hadn't been set up yet. They, uh, Aaron hadn't been picked as high priest yet. The Levites hadn't been picked. Who was he talking about when he said, make sure the priests and the people don't get too close? Well, what's fascinating, uh, that was one of the questions that I was emailed a couple weeks ago. Hey, okay, who were they then? Well, in that same chapter, you look at the first few verses, God tells all of Israel that you are to be priests to me. And so, but then you had the heir of Rav. You had the other people. But uh, so anyway, so I think it's interesting, though, that the people blew it and Aaron was the chief one. Because if you remember, Moses had written all the law in the book, gave it to Aaron before he went up. And he said to everybody, if you have any questions, go to Aaron. He's got the book. But what happened? Listen to this. Little does Aaron know how at the very moment in time, at that very moment, God is awarding him the role of the high priesthood, telling Moses he's going to be the high priest, okay? Here, Aaron is allowing the people to promote him into that position instead and have him make a golden calf. Talk about a missed opportunity. The Torah portion is all about him, and instead of him waiting for God's timing, he, like Saul, follows and obeys the people. Okay, what do we find in Exodus 28, 15? It says, you shall make a breastplate of judgment, the work of the skillful workman, like the work of the ephod, you shall make it of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twine, linen, you shall make it. Okay, so here's about the breastplate. Again, with the names of the children of Israel, we see in verse 21, the stone shall be according to the names of the children of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engraving of a signet, everyone according to his name, they shall be written uh, for, they shall be for the 12 tribes. Uh, amazing. Now, let me ask you this. I don't know if you remember, who were two of the chief artisans who were making everything for the tabernacle? Who? Betzalel and Aholiav. Okay. How old was Betzalel when he was making all of these things for the tabernacle? Does anybody have any idea how old Betzalel was, the skilled craftsman who was the main man given the job to build the Ark of the Covenant and the onyx stones and the breastplate? 13 years old. He was 13 years old. It's amazing. Uh, well, along that line, let me ask you this. How old was Jacob when he married his wives, worked for Laban, wrestled the angels, his kids were born, these 12 tribes? How old was Jacob? Does anyone have any idea how old Jacob was when he's working for Laban and he's wrestling an angel? Here we go. Here's your timeline. Uh, here, Isaac is 137 years old. He thinks he's going to die. He blesses Jacob and Esau, who are 77 years old. And so then Jacob goes, and he works seven years, and he ends up marrying Leah, and now he's 84 years old. And then he's got to work seven more years for Rachel. So now he's 91 years old. Then he works six years for the livestock and wrestles the angel at 97 years old. Can you imagine a 97-year-old man wrestling an angel all night and getting the best of them? That is something else. 
Okay, let's go on. Exodus 29, verse 19 and 20. Then he says, you're to take this other ram and Aaron and his sons and you to lay uh, and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. So when you see the high priest and his sons laying their hands on the head of the ram, what they're doing, they're transmitting in one sense their essence onto the ram. But what happened before that, all the people lay their hands on on the priest and so they're transferring their essence to the priest and then the priest transfer it to the animal and the animal is then uh, sacrificed and I think it's interesting this is at the dedication ceremony and it talks about then they're to take part of the blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons then on the thumbs of their right hands and on their big toes on their right foot and then throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Can you imagine? What a ceremony going on. You know, what's the point? Okay, I believe that the right ear or the ear is so that they hear from God. The right thumb, so they're working for the Lord. The big toe of the right foot, their walk is going to stay pure. Uh, and what is amazing is that same day, Nadab and Abihu die because their, their walk isn't right. Now, look at this in Exodus. This is 29, verse 38 and 39. It says, now this is that which you shall offer on the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, what? Continually. Continually. One lamb in the morning and the other lamb in the evening. So not only every morning and evening do they got to make sure the menorah stays lit, every morning and evening they also have to offer a sacrifice at the same time, a lamb. And then look at Exodus 29, verse 42 through 46. It says, this is to be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations. Can you imagine what you're thinking? Oh, my goodness, not just uh, every day I go to work, I do this, but this is going to go on for thousands of years. I mean, every generation is to make sure the fire never goes out on the altar or in the menorah. That is amazing. And then... Uh, it goes on and it says that it is to be done at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, which means he, it's before his face, just like you're supposed to face the judge. Okay, you don't turn your back on the king. Uh, here they're doing a sacrifice and it's before the Lord's face. And look at this. He says, where I will meet you to speak there to you, and there I will meet with the children of Israel. Now, is God everywhere? Yes. But guess what? He's not going to meet you everywhere. He is going to meet you at a certain time at a certain place. This is what this is saying. Not that God isn't the other places, but again, just like he said, I, I can't dwell with you in Egypt. We talked about last week. You got to get out of Egypt because I don't dwell in an unholy vessel in an unholy place. So I'm taking you to a holy set apart place and that's where I will meet with you. And he says, the children of Israel and the tabernacle will be sanctified by my glory. I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation, the altar. I'll sanctify Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel. I'll be their God, and they'll know that I am the Lord their God that brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And as we saw last week, not only did he want to dwell among them, he wanted to dwell within them. Now look at this in Exodus 30, verse 7 and 8. And Aaron shall burn on the altar of incense, sweet incense, how often? Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at even, he shall burn incense on it. A what? A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Okay. That means every morning, every evening, they were to worship the Lord. They had to light the menorah every morning, every evening. They had to light the, keep the incense altar going every morning, every evening. They had to do the evening and the morning sacrifice. What is that telling you? It's okay to worship on Sundays. 
It's okay to worship on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. So don't get on people's cases if they worship on Sunday. There's nothing wrong with that. What did God, the temple was here, we do it every day. It just doesn't make them the Sabbath. Okay? So uh, this is where we have to make sure we honor people that are doing what they're doing. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing, but they still can keep the Sabbath separate. Okay. Here's the other thing. How many of you know incense is likened to our prayers? That's what it says, which means our prayer life should also not be some random scattering of half-breathed prayers during our busy day, but we should try to establish a daytime, a daily time of prayer, even if it's a short time, okay? Uh, because what we're doing by our prayer time is recognizing God's presence. He wants to dwell with us. Okay, and ex- plus we also recognize his authority. He told us to do something, and we're doing it. Uh, let's look at Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. It says, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. He shall make atonement for it once in the year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. And then in Exodus 30, 11 through 16, Uh, The Lord says to Moses, look at this, when you take the census of the people of Israel, each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, so that there be no plague among them when you number them. How many of you know God does not want his people numbered? Okay, so what they do, they would number coins or they would number something else because the devil wants you to think you're just a number. God wants you to know you are much more valuable than just a number. It says, each one who is numbered in the census is to give half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. Everyone who's numbered, and it's only from 20 years old and upward, there to give an offering. And look at this. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than the half a shekel. Now, the purpose of this half shekel was for maintenance, just like you get taxed to have the roads and the schools kept going. This half shekel tax was to keep the tabernacle, okay, uh, functioning. That's what it was for. And then it says, you shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel, and you're to give it for the service of the tent of meeting, that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord, so as to make atonement for your lives. So uh, I think that's interesting. The concept is whenever you bring your offering, the Lord goes, oh, yeah, I remember you. It's almost like the Lord is watching as we're bringing our offerings. Oh, I remember you, and I remember you. Okay. As a matter of fact, how many of you have been to Israel? How many have been to Capernaum? Here we are. Here's a picture of Capernaum. Now, the, this white synagogue is built or 300 A.D., C.E., whatever you want to call it, but it is built directly on top of some black stone, which was the actual synagogue Yeshua was in. The foundation is still there to this day. Those that have been with us in Capernaum, they always would build synagogues on top of each other, and they always faced Jerusalem. And this is the north end of the Galilee, looking south toward Jerusalem. And then you see the Sea of Galilee there. Now, uh, these things, all of this here is the ancient couple thousand-year-old walls, you know, homes. And under this brand-new facility, they covered and protected what was Peter's house. And so that is where Peter lived. Uh, it's in that area there. And he was right next to the Sea of Galilee. Okay, he's a fisherman and he wants to be right there on the Sea of Galilee. Now, with this in mind, look at Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 through 27. It says, when they were come to Capernaum, those that received the half shekel, okay, they're talking about, for the maintenance of the sanctuary, came to Peter and said, hey, doesn't your teacher pay the half shekel? And he said, yeah. And when he came into the house, Yeshua spoke first to him saying, what do you think, Simon, the kings of the earth, from whom do they receive toll or tribute from their sons or from strangers? And when he said from strangers, Yeshua said to him, therefore, the sons are free. 
but lest we cause them to stumble, why don't you go out to the sea, throw in a hook, take up a fish, the first one that comes out, and when you've opened its mouth, you're going to find a whole shekel. And take that and give it to them, one for me and half shekel from each of us. Well, you know what's fascinating? Most Christians don't realize when they're reading this, this is telling us the date of when this happened. Because Nisan 1 is the beginning of the religious year, and the half shekel was always collected in the month of Adar, the last month. So when we're reading this, we're reading about the half shekel. We also know the time frame that this event literally took place right now. In this very month that we are even in right now, this is the month that it was done. Now we're going to take a moment and look at what the Haftor section is, and it's from 1 Samuel chapter 15. This has to be one of my most favorite chapters in the whole Bible. <laughs> it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, I have marked that which Amalek did to Israel, how he set himself against him in the way when he came out of Egypt. Now, he tells King Saul, the first king, you go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and don't even spare them. Okay, how many years have gone by? How long has it been from they left Egypt, Amalek attacks them, to their first king? Okay, how much time frame is... Uh, and God said, don't you ever forget, because when you get into the land and you have a king, I'm going to tell you to go get Amalek back. Well, I can tell you right now, it's been around 450 years. Twice as long as the United States has been around is how long it has been from the command to destroy Amalek when you get into the land to this time. So the period of the judges has all gone by. Saul's the first king. And so now he says, go get him. And so what does Saul do? Verse 8 and 9. He took Agag. He is the king of the Amalekites. He took him alive, but he utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, and of the cattle, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuge, that they destroyed utterly. Okay, what did God tell them to do? Destroy it all. But they didn't destroy, they kept what was best. Now Saul's the king, right? He's in charge. He's supposed to be the man. Okay, well, look at verse 10 and 11. The word of the Lord comes to Samuel, and he says, I regret that I even made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Okay, God said he has what? Not performed my commandments. And so Samuel, the prophet, was very angry, and it says he cried to the Lord all night long. I mean, Samuel's the one who anointed Saul as king, for heaven's sake. And now he's all mad because the Lord is upset. He's not a selfish man. He's, he's angry that the Lord has a broken heart. Look at verse 13 to 15. Samuel comes to Saul. And look at what Saul says to him. You are blessed by the Lord. Flattery, flattery. Okay. And look what he says. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Why is it he thinks he performed the commandment of the Lord, but the Lord doesn't think so? And I think all too often today, many people think that they're doing what the Lord says, but actually they're doing what they want, and they're kind of, uh, you know, making it look good. And it says, Samuel said this. Well, then what does the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the cattle, which I hear mean. Okay, there's a play on words here. The word Shema. What does Shema mean? Hear and obey. And he said, I shema I obeyed. And Samuel says, well, then how come I hear the sheep? I shouldn't be hearing any sheep bleeding or cattle lowing if you obeyed. It's the same word. Now, what happens? Saul says, they, he points the finger, the people, 
they brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, and we've utterly destroyed the rest. So he's trying to distance himself. I did what I was supposed to do, but uh, you know, he's the king. He takes no responsibility. Them ragamuffins out there, they brought all this stuff. Okay, and they wanted to sacrifice, though, to your God, so it's for a good purpose, right? So Samuel says in verse 19, why then didn't you obey the voice of the Lord? After all, you're king. You're the one that has all the authority. He says, why then didn't you obey the voice of the Lord, but you took the spoils and did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord? And then look at Saul's response. What a man. <laughs> but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have dis utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But it's the people. They took of the spoil sheep and cattle, the chief of the devoted things to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Oh, how come he doesn't say our God or my God? Why is it your God? And, oh, my goodness. I mean, this is just incredible. And, and so we end up finding in verse 24 and 25, Saul now speaks to Samuel again. And he said, okay, I've sinned. But you know what's interesting? There's like 10 different Hebrew words for sin depending on the level of the transgression. And he says it's a little thing. Okay, I missed the mark. This is a little sin. This isn't a grave sin. This isn't a big sin. For I have transgressed. Okay, that's a little bit stronger, but it's nowhere the depth of the transgression of the commandment of the Lord. And then he goes, and your words too. Why? He says, because I feared the people. Too often in so many countries, we have politicians who fear the people and they rule according to the fear of the people rather than what is right. That's the days that we live in right now. And then look what Saul has the gall to say to Samuel. He goes, okay, therefore, please pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. In other words, I need you to back me up here. I want to impress all the people and let them know that I'm worshiping the Lord. And with you by my side, it gives me some credential, credentials, you know, credibility. Oh, my goodness. And so look what Samuel says in verse 26 to 29. Samuel says to Saul, I'm not going to return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord's rejected you from being king over Israel. And then look at this. Samuel turns to go away. Saul grabs the skirt of his robe, and it ripped. And Samuel turned to him and said, guess what, buddy? The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day. And he's going to give it to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. Wow. And so look at verse 30. Saul says, okay, okay, I've sinned. Yet please honor me now before the elders of my people, not God's people. And he wants to be honored. He's, he could care less about God's honor that he's just totally ripped to shreds God's honor. He's concerned about his honor, how he appears before the people. Wow. Come back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. This is amazing. Look at Deuteronomy 25, 17, which happened 450 some years earlier. God tells Israel, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt? How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary? Cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you. He did not fear God. You know what? Neither did Saul. He feared the people. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies in the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance to possess, you are to blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven, and don't you forget it. Wow. That is amazing. Well, guess what? This is something that is mind-blowing. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 9, verse 1 and 2. It says, There was a man of Benjamin 
whose name was what? Kish. He was the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia, the son of a Benjamite, a mighty man of valor. And this man named Kish has a son whose name was what? Okay, so Saul, the first king's dad, was Kish. Okay, let's jump over this last few days. Where we're at right now is Purim, which is about the book of Esther. Esther. Oh, okay. And about Haman. All right. Look at this in Esther 2, 5. There was a certain Jew in the citadel of Susha whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yer, the son of Shammai, the son of who? Oh, my goodness, 400 years later, Mordecai is a direct descendant of Saul. And look at this in Esther 3.10. We see the king took a ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the what? Agagite. Excuse me. The Jew's enemy. Where does Agagite come from? King Agag, the royal line of the Amalekites. So what do we see? God knew what was going to happen 450 years later, that the Amalekites were going to try to destroy all the Jews. So he says, let's beat him to the punch. And so what does he do? He tells Saul, it's time to wipe out the Amalekites. He doesn't do it. So what happens 450 some years later? Here you have Mordecai, a direct descendant of Saul, encountering Haman, a direct descendant of Agag. And Saul did not obey. Okay, and so because he didn't obey now, Four generations or 400 years later, the same encounter. All right. Now, if you remember, about another 500 or so years later, there's another man named Saul, the Apostle Saul. And what tribe is he from? Benjamin. And now you have these people, Christians coming along, or what, Messianic Jews, however you want to look at it, and Saul is slaughtering him because he does not want to be like his great-great-great-grandpa. But God has to intervene and say, wrong group. <laughs> but I think it's interesting. This is where you get the understanding that history repeats itself. The same play, different characters. This is why it's so important to understand the book of Daniel and the story of Hanukkah. I believe both Purim and Hanukkah are going to repeat themselves and have repeated themselves. I believe Hitler was a type of Haman. His main goal was just to kill all the Jews. And, hey, and Purim comes before Hanukkah historically. Well, we just experienced a Purim with World War II. What's next? The Hanukkah repeat. And what's the difference between Antiochus and the story of Hanukkah and Haman, the story of Purim? Haman wanted to annihilate all the Jews. He did not care. Antiochus does not want to annihilate them. He wants them to assimilate. If they don't assimilate, they'll be annihilated. And so I believe we're entering a time where the world is going to let you keep your Jesus, but you're going to have to assimilate and you're still going to have to worship other things along with your Jesus for you to survive. Okay, now, fascinating. I went a little bit over, but let's stand, and we'll pray, and then we'll jump into the book of Daniel. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that we can come together and learn from you, to study your word. Your word echoes through every generation. Father, your word is true. What we have before us is a book of truth, not a book of emotions. God, your word stands forever. And so, Lord, we just want to submit ourselves to your Torah, 
your instruction, your teaching. And Lord, I just thank you so much for all those that are here locally, all those in the United States, all those live streaming from all over the world who bring their offerings to take your Torah to the nations through El Shaddai Ministries. God, this is your ministry. It's not ours. And all we want to do is to magnify the Torah and to make it honorable once again. And here we are in the month of Adar, the month of collecting the offerings, Father, to build a dwelling place where you can dwell with us. And I just thank you so much that uh, through the Internet, we can all dwell and come together and love one another. Father, uh, I just pray right now during this time that we're living in right now that you would touch hearts. Father, let people know they are connected and they're not alone. And we thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, <coughs> creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen, and now we will have a time of worship, and then we will jump into decoding Daniel. Wow, here we are in the book of Daniel. Now, here's the chart from last week where I kind of given you different ways to read through the book of Daniel. Last week, we, we started with Daniel 8, where Daniel fainted, and he was sick. And then he says, afterward, I rose up and I did the king's business and I was astonished at the vision. But look at this. How many understood it? None. Nobody understood it. Now, Daniel 8 is the last year of Belshazzar. In Daniel 5, he dies. And then the very next day, we see Darius steps up to the plate and he's in charge. And as you see in this chart, Daniel 6, 9, 11, uh, and 12 are all the first year of Darius the Mede. So there's different ways that you can read it, but just know they all happen that first year. And what do we find in Daniel 11? Here, Daniel faints, he's sick, and in Daniel 11, 1 from last week, it says, I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. We talked about who is the I and who's the him. And I believe as we read, we'll see that it was the angel Gabriel strengthening Daniel. Now, last week we went through the history of Daniel 11 and Antiochus and uh, all that that entailed. I hope you enjoyed. Wasn't that fun last week? That was amazing. Okay, well, we're going to continue because I had to stop in Daniel 11, so we're going to pick it up in verse 36 through 39. It says, and the king will do as he wills. He will exalt who? Himself. Himself. And magnify who? Himself. Himself above every god. And he's going to speak astonishing things against the god of gods. Now, again, we have to remember history does what? Okay, so all of this has already happened, but he's telling us, look at the pattern. Be looking for someone who it's all about them. That is the key to decoding the Antichrist. When we look at the pattern and say, okay, this is humankind. This is how this type of a leader will come. Okay, and it says he will prosper. Okay, he's going to be successful <clears throat> until the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. Now look at this. He's not going to pay any attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one that is beloved by women. He's not going to pay attention to any other god. But basically, he thinks he's God. He's going to magnify himself above all. Instead, he's going to honor the god of the military, basically, fortresses, instead of gods. A God whom his fathers did not know, he will honor with gold and silver, precious stones, costly gifts. 
He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Look at this. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. That is huge. That is huge. Wow, talk about this. Whoever acknowledges him, he's going to load with honor. Total flattery, okay? Uh, this is amazing. And those that acknowledge him, he's going to make them the rulers over everybody. And then he's going to divide the land. What land do you think he's talking about? <laughs> exactly. That's why Joel says, woe to those that divide or part my land. So this is what we're looking for, is someone who declares it's all about them. He's going to flatter people. He's going to have power. He's going to be prosperous. He's going to have success. And then what he's going to do is he's going to pick those people who acknowledge him as the top dog. He'll let them be the ones who rule over many. And now look at verse 40 through 45. <clears throat> at the time of the end, the king of the south, this is Egypt, <clears throat> will attack him. But the king of the north, that's the Seleucids, will rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen with many ships. He'll come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He'll come into the glorious land. Where's that? Israel. Tens of thousands will fall, but these will be delivered out of his hand. Edom and Moab and the main parts of the Ammonites, in other words, Jordan. He will stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt will not escape. He'll become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver, the precious things of Egypt. The Libyans and the Cushites will follow in his train, but news from the east and the north, okay, will alarm him. And he will go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. Okay, so this says he doesn't care about people. He's going to destroy as many people as he can. And he will pitch his palatial tents between basically the, Mered uh, the Mediterranean Sea and Mount Zion. That's what this is referring to. The Mediterranean Sea and the Temple Mount. And yet he shall come to his end with no one to help him. Okay, now to chapter 10. Now, if you'll notice, chapter 10 really is the last chapter. It's not, even though chapter 12 is the last chapter in the book, chapter 10 is really the last chapter, but we're going to tie in chapter 12 as well today. So here we go, Daniel 10, 1 through 4. <clears throat> it is now the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. <clears throat> now, who knows about what, year this is. Does anyone know about when this is? Okay. <clears throat> it's going to be roughly 470, something like that. We know finally in 444 uh, is when Darius, the king of Persia, makes a decree to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Cyrus wasn't concerned about the walls of Jerusalem. He was concerned about the temple. And so that happens a couple of decades earlier. Okay, now watch this. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And this word is what? It is true. And it was about a great conflict. And he understood. Finally, he gets it at the very end. He understood the word and had understanding of the vision. Okay, it took a while. But how many of you know for us it takes a while too? All right. He finally gets it. He understood the vision. And because he understood the vision, look what happens. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for how many weeks? Okay, what month was this in? Let's look and see what the Bible says. It says, I was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine even entered my mouth. I didn't anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. 
And on the 24th day of what? The, what happens in the first month? Passover. Passover is what day? Nisan 14. And then comes unleavened bread, Nisan 15. It lasts for seven days through Nisan 22. This is now Nisan 24. He, of course, he couldn't keep the Passover anyway. He's in Babylon. The temple is destroyed. But think about this. It was three weeks during the month of Nisan through Passover that he is mourning. Okay? And look at this. He's on the 24th day of the first month. I was standing on the bank of the great river, which is which river? The Tigris River, and it is Passover. Well, guess what? This morning, I spent some time, and I grabbed Google Images. Okay, you can see in the very bottom corner, there's Baghdad. All right? Well, there's the Euphrates. Here is the Tigris, and you'll notice the Tigris kind of winds its way down right into the Baghdad, which was Babylon. So this is where Daniel was. I don't know, if Jill, if you have that little clip or not. If you don't, I'm not worried about it. Okay. Two seconds. One Mississippi. <laughs> two Mississippi. Okay. We'll see if it's going to work here. I wanted to give you a little visual of the Tigris River if we have it here. I'm not sure we do. But anyway, I wanted to give you a, a greater feel of uh, this is where he is. Yeah, well, okay, here it comes. Here it comes. Watch this little short little video clip here. See if we can play it. But there it is. This is right outside of Babylon. There's the Tigris River. And look what he sees right there uh, at the Tigris River. That's where he was. We'll come back to that. But first, get a lot of this. It was the third year of Cyrus. And I told you that's around 470 B.C., right? When did Isaiah live? When was Isaiah prophesying? He's around 760 B.C. We're talking around 300 years. The United States is a little over 200 years. We're talking Isaiah's prophesying around 300 years before Cyrus was even born. And look at Isaiah. Here's the prophecy by name of Cyrus. Remember last week, Alexandria was shown the, you know, hey, guess what? Uh, I don't mean Alexandria, I, I mean uh, King Alexander, Alexander the Great, how the Jews showed him how he, basically he's right there in the book of Daniel. Well, can you imagine when they approached Cyrus and said, look, Isaiah mentioned you by name 300 years ago. Look at this, Isaiah 44, 28 through 45, 1, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He will fulfill all my purpose, <laughs> unlike Saul, uh, Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built into the temple. Your foundation shall be laid. It hadn't even been destroyed yet in Isaiah's time. I mean, if, if you were listening to Isaiah and they were talking about the, the temple is going to be built, what do you mean? It's already built. What, what you know? Your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, to loosen the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. Isn't that amazing? Cyrus by name is mentioned several centuries before he was even born. Now here's the question. <clears throat> Why in the third year of Cyrus, when Cyrus has already said, let everything be built in the first year, why is Daniel mourning? Does anyone know why he is mourning? Well, let's look at what the Bible says. Let's go to Ezra chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, 
the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, we want to build with you, for we worship your God just as you do. And we've been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esar Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. This is referring to the Samaritans. But Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and the rest of the heads of the father's houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building the house to our God. We alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, just as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So what do you think the Samaritans did? Oh, okay, see ya. No. It says, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah. They made them afraid to build. They bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. They say Cyrus revoked the permission to build the temple after he had said it was. And others say they frustrated the purposes so they couldn't get done. So by the third year of Cyrus, Daniel seeing the temple has been stopped. They're not rebuilding it. So he's mourning for three weeks trying to find out what is going on. I thought Cyrus, king of Persia, was on our side. How come things aren't getting done? Now, how many of you know it was God's will that the temple be built? He told Isaiah several centuries before, Cyrus is the man that's going to do it. Well, guess what? The prince of Persia, and I'm talking about the spiritual prince of Persia, doesn't want the temple rebuilt. And how many of you know today, who's modern Persia? Iran. And we're having problems with Iran, okay? And believe me, they don't, they're the religious zealot in Islam, and they don't want a temple to be rebuilt either. So let's look at Daniel. Go back to chapter 10, verse 5 through 8. Daniel lifts up his eyes, and behold, there is a man clothed in linen. When you hear the word linen and the man clothed in linen, what role do you think this person has? A priest. He has a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl. His face like the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Can you imagine a voice that is like the roar of the ocean as it is speaking? And Daniel says, I alone saw the vision. The other guys that were with me didn't see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Who do you think this man clothed in linen with eyes like flaming torches and arms and legs like bronze might have been? Yeshua. Yeah, sure. Well, let's look at Revelation. Let's look at what John sees in chapter 1. Well, let's going to combine verse 12 and 15. John turns to see the voice that was speaking to me, and turning, I saw a menorah, seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstand is one like to who? The Son of Man. And look at this. He is clothed with a long robe has a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. And here it is. He sees the same thing. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in the furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. Who do you think that was? That was Yeshua. As a matter of fact, what's Fascinating. I mean, can you imagine to hear a voice like that? I think when uh, he calls down from heaven, hello, do you hear me now? Uh, people are going to hear. As it, look at Ezekiel 1, 26 to 28. Here, Ezekiel also has a vision, and he sees 
on the top of the arch, which was over their heads, was the form of a king's throne, like a sapphire stone. And on the form of the seat was the form of a man seated on it on high. I wonder if that might be the Messiah. And I saw it colored like electrum with the look of fire in it and around it going up from what seemed to be the middle of his body. And going down from what seemed to be the middle of his body, I saw what was like fire. And there was a bright light shining all around him like the rainbow in the clouds on a day of rain. So it was light shining around him. And this is what the glory of the Lord was like. And when I saw it, I hit my nose on the ground and the voice of one talking came into my ears. Isn't that amazing how parallel all of these are? And I believe Yeshua is the, the menorah. Because remember, the tabernacle on earth is patterned after the one in heaven. There's a menorah in heaven who's the light of the world, Yeshua. And this is why it had to be kept burning as we talked about this morning because the light, and Yeshua was the light of the world, is never to go out. So look at what happens. Then I heard the sound of what? Man, underline that, circle that. Daniel says, I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of what? His words, I fell on my face. He had a busted nose by now, <laughs> falling on his face constantly. In a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Can you just see him on his hands and knees just trying to get up? And he said to me, oh, Daniel, man, greatly loved Understand the words that I speak to you and stand up for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up, but I'm still trembling. And then he said to me, fear not Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and now I've come because of your words. Think about this. His words sent John on his face when the Messiah spoke with a loud roar of waters. Daniel's on his face. And yet, even though his words make Daniel tremble, he says, I came because of your words. And for the last three weeks, I've been trying to make a connection and get a hold of you because of your words. And then listen, Daniel 10, verse 13 and 14 the prince of the kingdom of Persia had withstood me for how many days? And how long was he fasting and praying? His words. And now we believe this is the Messiah. He's battling the prince of Persia. And it says, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people. And who are Daniel's people? The Jews. He is from Judah, even. Okay. And it says here, in the latter days, for the vision is for days to come. Now, why would Yeshua need help? It would have been no problem, but he wants to partner with you. He was waiting for an intercessor. He was waiting to hear someone's words that I want to partner with you because Abba, as your dad, wants to work with his children. It is no problem for him to do it, but he wants to participate with you, and he's waiting to hear from you. 
he did not respond until he heard Daniel's words. Daniel was amazed at the angel's words and the voices. Well, that's all cool, but God says, I am waiting and I will not act till I hear from you. I, to me, this is mind-blowing. Look at the prophetic times we're living in. Right now, God is waiting to hear from you. He's not going to, he's, go, he's going to wait. He wants to hear from somebody. And if he doesn't hear from you, he'll hear from someone else. So my question is, why not you? Why not you? Why can't you be the Daniel in this generation? And guess what? We're coming up upon Nisan. And this big battle with Persia was during the month of Nisan. And I believe in patterns that some year, could it be this year? That just as a heavenly battle is going on up there, one comes down on earth, I will bet my bottom dollar you're going to see a problem with Iran some year during the month of Nisan. That's why this battle was taking place, because Passover is huge, for heaven's sake, everybody. That's the pattern. This is the divine appointments. So I really believe that this Passover, maybe there are some people that might fast who knows? But I tell you what, God is waiting to hear from you before he does things. He wants to hear from us. So look at Daniel 10, 15 through 17. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face to the ground and I was mute. I couldn't speak. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips then I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who stood before me, O oh, my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me. I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is even left in me. And so look at verse 15, or verse 18 through 20. Again, one having the appearance of a man touch me, and what did he do? Do you see why Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 go together? Okay, at the end of the Daniel 8, he has no strength. He can barely get up. He's sick. And now all of a sudden, here he is. And look at this. He said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of a good courage. What do we say at the end of every book of the Torah? Kazak, Kazak, be neat, Kazak, be strong, be strong. May we all be strengthened. This is what Moses said to Joshua before he passed. This is what God said to Joshua, be strong and have a good courage. This is what the people said to Joshua, be strong and have a good courage. And here we are, and we see be strong and of a good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my more Lord speak for you have strengthened me. And then he said, you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Kazakh, Kazakh, Vinet, Kazakh. I think it's fascinating is in the heavenly realm, he's fighting the prince of Persia. And who historically comes after Persia? Greece. Alexander the Great. That's why he said, when I'm done, the prince of Greece will come. Okay, historically, this has all already happened. But you look at the patterns. We have to follow the patterns. And one of the things that's fascinating to me is, this big fight with Persia or Iran is during the month of Nisan. And there will be a transition after Iran is gone from the scene. Now look at Daniel 10, 21. It says, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of what? What's the word for truth? Emmet. That's the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. I, I think that is amazing. Here, Michael, he is the one who's fighting beside the Lord against the prince of Persia. Now, 
Here we are in Daniel 9, 25 through 27. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now it's not talking the temple here. Now it's talking the city. Until Messiah the Prince, he'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is how many weeks? 69 weeks, okay? The street will be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. We know that happened. That's what Herod did. And after the 62 weeks, will Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So at the end, not in the middle of a week, at the end of a week, Messiah is cut off. And then it says, and we know that happened in 30 AD. And then the people of the prince, now we know Titus came and destroyed the city, but Titus didn't want to do that, really. But the people, he, that, his soldiers did. <clears throat> They'll come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, which we know has already happened. And the end thereof shall be with the flood to the end of the war. Desolations are determined. And we know there's a 40-year gap there from the time Messiah was cut off to when it was destroyed. So we know there's gaps in verses. And then it says he'll confirm the covenant with many for one week or seven years. And in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations. He'll make it desolate even till the consummation, and that determines he'll be poured upon the desolate. Okay, so that says that in the middle of a week, if he causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease, that means sacrifices and oblations have to be going on. Okay, which is why people believe in a seven-year tribulation, and in the middle of the tribulation, the temple will be, they may not even build a big temple. It could just be a sacrificial system. We don't know to the extent, but I know with the Temple Institute, a lot of it is pretty much ready to, to go at a moment's notice. Okay, now let's jump over to Daniel 12, 1 through 4, since we were talking about Michael anyway in Daniel 10. We see Michael introduced on the scene, and Michael will stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of your people, and there will be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, look at this, your people will be delivered. Everyone that is found written in what? Which book? i tell you what, that book of truth. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is referring to Rosh Hashanah, guys. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. But look at though this. There's going to be some that are wise. They're going to shine as the brightness of the firmament. Those that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And then he says, but you, Daniel, for now, why don't you shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. I believe that may be referring to secular knowledge, which is the times we're living in now. But I think more than that, it's referring to biblical knowledge and an understanding of the times. As a matter of fact, going back to the time of trouble and your people will be delivered. Look at Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> Ask now and see whether man travails with child. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, that day is great. There's none like it. It is even the time of what? But he shall be saved out of it. Israel is going to be saved out of this time of trouble. Now, in that book I showed you, which was written by Orthodox Jews, I think it fascinating that they say this time of trouble refers to a time of extreme lawlessness. And how about when the judges are lawless? The Supreme Court judges are lawless. I mean, it's pretty bad when the people are lawless, but what about when the politicians are lawless and the judges are lawless? We are living in in these times and they're referred to as the birth pangs of the Messiah now again let's go back and look at Leviticus 16 verse 3 and 4 to confirm something it says in this way Aaron I think this is so cool how 
this section of Daniel ties into the Torah portion we were just reading. But it says here, in this way, Aaron will come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering, a ram for burnt offering. And look at this. He will put on the holy linen coat and shall have on the linen undergarment on his body. He shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. And these are the holy garments. So when Daniel sees this man clothed in linen, this man is what? A uh, priest, and if it's Yeshua, it's going to be the high priest in his linen garments. With that understanding now, let's go back to Daniel 12, verse 5 through 7. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others are standing, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. Okay, so you got this stream or this river, and you have an angel on one side, and you got an angel on the other side of the river. And then it looks, look at this. It says, and someone said to the man who is clothed in linen, who is above the waters of the stream. So you got an angel on this side of the river, an angel on this side of the river, and there's a man hovering above the river. Okay. Clothed in linen. Now look at this. This man clothed in linen that's above the river, he raises his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and he swears by him who lives forever. Now, imagine this. Here's this man who is above the stream, and it says he raises his right hand and his left hand. And he's swearing, and we can't help but think of a court. You raise your right hand, and here he's raising his left hand. But I want to give you another meaning. As this priest, he's raising his right hand and his left hand. And what is, you know, it's like the priestly blessing. This is the letter Shin for Shaddai. This is El Shaddai who is above the waters. And he says it'll be a time, times, and a half a time. Now listen. And that when the shattering, the shattering of the power of the holy people come to an end, all these things would be finished. So all the things are not finished until the power of the holy people become shattered. Did you, everyone see that? Listen to this now. Here we come to Deuteronomy 32, 36, which is the Song of Moses, which is the revelation of the Torah, talking about end times. And it says, the Lord will vindicate his people. He will have compassion on his servants when he sees their power is gone and there's none remaining bond or free. That is like a direct quote from what we just read in Daniel. When the shattering of the holy people are gone, come to an end, that's when everything would be finished. And here in Deuteronomy, the Lord will vindicate his people of compassion on his servants when he sees their power is gone. Look at Revelation. This is chapter 10, verse 1 through 6. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow on his head. His face were as it were the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He has in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. He cries with a loud voice as when a lion roars. Who is this? This is Yeshua. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal it up. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. Don't write them. And the angel which I saw stand on the sea and on the earth lifted up his hand toward heaven. Isn't that interesting? Kind of like what we were just reading. And the angel can mean messenger. It doesn't have to mean angel. And the angel which I saw stand on the sea and on the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that lives forever and ever. Who created heaven, the things that are there on the earth, the things that are therein in the sea, the things that are in therein, that there should be time no longer. This is it. 
And I think the fact he's got his feet on both the sea and the earth is saying he is Lord of all. This is the king of kings. And guess what? Time's up. And when time is up, time is up. How many of you remember in school when you had a time test and when the thing, thing, put your pencils down. That means you got to put your pencils down. There, there is no more. Now look at Daniel 12, 8 through 13. I heard, but I did not understand. And I said, oh, my Lord, what is going to be the outcome of all this? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are what? Shut up and sealed until the time of the end. How many believe we're at the time of the end? That means an opening is about to be happen, and we will knowledge will be increased. And it says, many will purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But look at this. The wicked are continu- going to continue to act wickedly. None of the wicked are going to understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up shall be 1290. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1335, but go your way to the end, and you will rest and stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Do you know there is an allotted place waiting for you? There is an allotted place waiting for you. I think what's interesting is we read sometimes 1260, sometimes 1290. Another place we read that it's a time, a times, and a half a time, right? Well, when it says a time, times, and a half a time, it could be 1260 or 1290. depends if there's a second month of Dar 2 thrown in. So a time, times, and a half a time can refer to 1260, but it also can refer to 1290 if you have an Adar 2. Now, here's the other thing that I found interesting. When you look at the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335, if the 1260 is right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, when did Yeshua go up in John 7 to the Feast of Tabernacles? It was in the midst of the feast. If you go to the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles and count that as the 1260, so that would be, okay, Tishri 15, tabernacles begin. Okay, let's say Tishri 17 is the 1260. If you add 30 days to 1290 from Tishri 17, that takes you to Heshvan 17, which is the day of Noah's flood. And it will be like the days of Noah, Heshvan 17. And then if you add the 45 days from Heshvan 17, that takes you to the third of Tibet, the last day of Hanukkah. And so I find it very fascinating that you can tie the 1260, the 1290, the 1335 from the middle of Sukkot to the day of Noah's flood to the last day of Hanukkah. Just interesting thought. Okay, but now let's jump to Revelation chapter 22. Look at verse 8 through 13. I, John, saw these things, and I heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. And then he said to me, Don't do this. I'm your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Now look at this. Worship God. And then he says to me, What? Don't seal. Don't seal the sayings of the prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand. And look how this parallels the book of Daniel. Uh, It says, he that is unjust will be unjust still. He that which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Him that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. That's just what we just got done reading in the book of Daniel. And then get a load of this. You Look at Isaiah. I mean, Revelation. Uh, We're still in Revelation 22, 8 through 13. Look at the end of this verse in Revelation. What does he say? Behold, I come quickly, and my reward 
is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Okay, it says, behold, I'm coming quickly. I've got a reward to give everyone according as his work shall be. Now, when we think, what does that mean? What do we think that means? He's going to reward us according to our works. Is that right? But it's wrong. How do I know it's wrong? He's quoting Isaiah. So let's go back and see how Isaiah phrases it. It says, go, this is Isaiah 62, 10 through 12. Go through, go through the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. I think it's interesting. It's not prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now it's prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world. Say you to the daughter of Zion. And here comes, here comes the quotation. Behold, your salvation cometh. What's the Hebrew word for salvation? Yeshua. Yeshua. Behold, I'm coming. And in Revelation, my reward is with me. And what do we see here in Isaiah? His reward is with him. And his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out a city not forsaken. So think about this. It's not according to your works, but it's according to his work in you. It's according as his work shall be. When it says his in Revelation there, According as his uh, work shall be, it's his work in you, not your works. What is happening is the trophy that the son sets at his father's feet is you. And it's my work that I've done in you. We are going to be rewarded not so much for our works because they're not our works. It's his works he's done through us. And so the question is, your reward is based on how much you've obeyed and submitted yourself to the Lord for him to work in you. It's not your works. It's his work through you. Cain was celebrating his work. Abel was celebrating his work. You following me? And when we come and show, here's what I've done for you, God. And I don't want to see that. I want to see what I've done through you. This is mind-blowing to me. Look at Ephesians 2.10. You are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua to good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. You are his work that he will present to the Father, and your reward will be based on how much you allowed him to work in you and with you and through you. That's a whole other way of looking at this. Because if we're building with wood, hay, and stubble, what is Yeshua going to show the Father? If you're building with gold, silver, precious stones, because it's not for our glory, it's for his glory. So we need to quit building. That's when he looks to see if you're out of plumb. Are you out of plumb? Are you building the house for you? Or are you building the house through me, for me? I mean, this is amazing. This is why you have to connect. There's over 600 verses in the Tanakh that Revelation is referring to. And if you don't make the connection, you're not going to make the connection. So there's the book of Daniel for you guys to chew on, to think about. (laughs) Next week, for those that want to look ahead, next week, the second half, We're going to tackle Psalms 119. Look at that. I'm really looking forward to that. But for now, let's stand.
And let's pray that we can learn from the book of Daniel and see the patterns and, and realize same play, different people. Okay? Avidum Okenu, a Father King, we just thank you so much for your Torah that we can study. Father, you said in your word that knowledge will be increased. And it's mind blowing to me that you respond to our words. Your words are like an ocean. It's awesome. We fall on our face before you, but you're waiting to hear our words. Our words of love, our, our words of submission. Father, we, we want to tear down what we've been building for ourselves. And if we need to start over, we're going to start over. But, Father, we want you to build your kingdom through us. It's not our kingdom, it's your kingdom. So, Father, we're excited about even this coming Passover, this month of Nisan. Uh, and I believe many will seek your face through prayer and fasting, Father, and use the, these same words of Daniel's prayer, Father, to knock on heaven's gates, and we know you will respond. And we thank you for it. God, open the eyes of our understanding. And we thank you so much that we're not just your servants. We're your sons and daughters. And you want to place your name upon us. You not only want to bless us, you want to place your name upon us. Even as you told Aaron to say, Ye saw Adonai, panav ilecha biasem laka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Ayah, Asher, Ayah. Amen. Go in peace. We'll see you next week. <laughs>